Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay. They were pumping hallucinogens into the audience, clearly. Emayatsi, are you here? Did she make it yet? Here she is, Emayatsi Cornelio. And her husband, Jay. <laughs> I'm going to start with the first question, but we have mics set up here if you'd like to ask a question. If you have a question in the balcony, you've actually got to come downstairs and come down to the mic to ask it. Or just yell it out. I can, we can hear you. I'll repeat the question if it's too quiet. This is such a, a it's just a, t from a bold a bold imagining, you know? So I would love to hear, I mean, it's such a great big subject and you had to start somewhere and you went to this really bold place. I'd love to hear about that. Um, well, when, when we were, you know, doing all the research and thinking about how do you take this, you know, one of the greatest voices of the 20th century and, and uh, this artist's life and, you know, who was relevant for 40 years, 50 years in music, like, where do you start? And we thought of this five-year period when he was silent. You know, how does one of the most prolific voices uh, shut it down? And what's happening during that period of time? And, and, and how does he get out of that? Does he get out of it? You know, a lot of writers around that time that were trying to, that were like Dave Braden, that were trying to get in there and talk to Miles, didn't know if they were gonna be writing an obituary or if they are gonna be writing a comeback story. And, you know, it wasn't clear what was going to happen with Miles. You know, there were, there were weeks and months uh, at a time that no one knew what was going on with them. Vince would tell me and Herbie would tell me stories about going and knocking on the door and, you know, Miles would open it just to crack and say, you know, go get me some catfish, you know, and they'd leave and <laughs> come back and bring in some food and he'd go, all right, motherfucker, and shut the door and he would, they wouldn't see him again. So that just seemed like a, an interesting uh, point of departure for us. And I, I always wanted to do something that felt to me like the experience that I have when I listen to his music. And, you know, use, you know, use a narrative that could employ all of his music. I didn't want to be locked into a period, you know, and sort of do a cliff notes of Miles Davis' life and just check off all the boxes. Well, this is when he met Dizzy, and this is when he met Charlie Parker, and this is when he left Juilliard, and this is when he went from bebop to modal, and this is when he met, you know, went and worked with Gill and the non-net. I just wanted to tell something that felt free form and, you know, uh, impressionistic and felt like his music to me, which, you know, was boundless. I'll start with you, go ahead. Um, first and foremost, congratulations. I've been following you since uh, you transformed to Earl the Goat Manigault. Yeah, there you go. Um, so I'm here for you, but I'm also here for my mom. She's a big Miles Davis fan. She's a fan of dark chocolate. So uh, just as you started um, as an actor, is this where you thought you would end up? Is this, was this the goal to be the director, writer, and uh, performing your own no, no, this wasn't really anything that I was out there trying to, to do. Um, the first person that was hammering me to direct was Carl Franklin, who directed Devil in a Blue Dress. And uh, yeah, great. You know, I said, oh, I want to write this thing. And he said, well, you got to direct it too and do all of it. He said, you're going to write it anyway. You're going to end up rewriting it anyway, so you might as well just write it and do it. And um, when I worked with Warren Beatty on Bullworth, he was also someone who was always advocating for me to, uh, to direct, you know, and I'd say, I I'm not ready. And he's like, I'm not, I wasn't ready when I did Reds. You know, you're, not, you're never ready. You just do it and figure it out. So uh, it was something that other people had been pushing me to do, but nothing that I was, had really sought out. And, and when Vince sort of, you know, declared that this was something that I was gonna do, <laughs> um, it was something that, you know, I was on the glide path toward. And I, I tried to give the movie away, honestly, a few years ago. I tried to find someone else to direct it, and I tried to, you know, if it had evaporated, I would have actually been relieved. 
because it was such a huge undertaking, but at some point it felt more like a, a monkey on my back if I, if I weren't able to, to see it through. So this wasn't a, this wasn't a plan, it just kind of turned out that way. And can Mama Q get a shout out from Miles Davis? <laughs> What's good, Mama? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess that was part of the question I was going to ask, but... You, you got a Mama Q, too? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, the first part of the question. Um, actually, well, since you said it's screenwriting and directing and doing pretty much everything by yourself, well, not by yourself, but you were pushed to do so, the um, performance element of the trumpet, did you have any musical experience before that? Um, I played uh, sax um, and was in bands all through you know, elementary school and junior high school. And one of my bandmates is here, Kurt Cohen, back there. Raise your hand. <laughs> one of my oldest friends. Jesse Borrego is here, too, another old friend of mine. What's up, Jesse? San Antonio's own Jesse Borrego. But I played in bands all of my life, um, up, up to and up through high school. But it was sax. And I sang in combos and sang in jazz groups. and. Uh, I had never played trumpet, though. Um, my introduction to trumpet was actually when I did Rat Pack and played Sammy Davis Jr. And I had to learn how to play drums and tap dance and play the trumpet and twirl guns and <laughs> drink heavily. I, I, I did it all. Um, but that was sort of my first uh, entree into that. And then once I knew that I was going to uh, take this on, I uh, started, you know, I, I got a trumpet, actually, I bought a Martin Committee trumpet online, and it was a piece of shit, and <laughs> it didn't play that great, and uh, then I got an another horn, and now I got a really nice horn now, Manette, and uh, I started, oh, yeah, congratulations, for Manette. <laughs> but uh, started, you know, just carrying it with me everywhere and playing it a lot, and, you know, I, I play every day, still. I'm not any good, but I play every day. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, first of all, great job, both of you, uh, for the movie, a tour of five, right here. Oh. Um, I was at the conversation with you, uh, and one question that was asked to you was uh, why you don't do uh, more comedies because of the very uh, comedic aspects that you bring to your movies, and you said that nobody really asks you to do anything, and nobody really brings it up to you, uh, and that somebody had an idea to let you know. Right after that question, uh -oh. I kind of thought of an idea. Don't say it out loud. I, I'm on, I'm on, Don't I'm on. say it out loud. You wanna talk later at all? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you who to talk to. See me afterwards. Yeah, sounds yeah, good, man. Cool. Cool. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, That's mine, dibs on whatever his idea is. Uh, hi, Mr. Cheadle. It's an I honor. Do. I think the, <laughs> all right. the first movie I saw you in was uh, Steven Soderbergh's Traffic when mm -hmm. I was like 10, so it's a Big honor talking to you. Thank um, you. What I want to know is what drew you to Miles Davis's life? Why did you need to t feel the need? Sorry, I'm very nervous right now. Why did you feel the need to tell his story from your own perspective slash interpretation? Well, you know, as I said, it was, it had been swirling around uh, me uh, before Vince made his uh, declaration. Uh, M. Tume, someone who had played with Miles, uh, it mentioned it to me. I saw Quincy Troop, who wrote the autobiography with Miles at a, an event for Hotel Rwanda, I think, at the, uh, in L.A. at uh, House of Blues, and he had said something about it. And uh, when I was doing the Rat Pack, I bought a drum set, and I didn't, you know, I had my friend come set. He said, I'll have my friend come help, you know, he'll set it up for you. And it was Tootie Heath. I was like, damn, Tootie Heath. And so Tootie Heath came over and said, like, you know, you look a lot like Miles. You ever think about playing in a Miles Davis thing? And so it had kind of been swirling around, but Vince was really the one who, uh, you know, as I said, uh, you know, threw the gauntlet down. But when I said yes, even in, when I met with them and they pitched me different ideas, they all felt like territory that we'd been to before, or at least they, it all felt like ways to tell the story that I had seen before. And I wanted to, you know, do something that I thought Miles would want to star in, as opposed to tell a movie that was about his life, so to speak. Uh, I wanted it to feel like Don Cheadle is Miles Davis as Miles Davis in Miles Ahead. That's, <laughs> that's kind of what I wanted it to be. 
And, um, and after, you know, Vince and Aaron, you know, were like, wow, really? okay. They uh, thankfully let me uh, take this approach. It, it, for me, it needed to feel not to denigrate any other, you know, biopics out there, but it, it, it just needed to feel different to me. I, I think to take this artist's life and do something that was, you know, done before would be in directly contravening what he said his whole life about not repeating yourself and being different and, and fear no mistakes for there are none. And, you know, Herbie would tell stories about, you know, like Miles, you know, said, I, I pay you to practice in front of people, yeah. which is so liberating. You know, if he heard you rehearsing some solo in your hotel room and you came down on stage and played that solo, he would fire you. It's like, I don't, I don't pay you to come bring your polished work. I pay you to jump off a ledge and figure it out with a bunch of other musicians. And I think as artists, that's very exciting. Yeah. to uh, always be about trying to figure it out as opposed to saying, I've arrived, you know? It's always about, you know, destination is, the journey is the destination, you know? Yeah. I'm gonna right. jump in actually with my own question for Mayatsi. Is it different um, working with a, an, a director who's an actor, that, you know, who you're acting with? Yeah, it's very different. It, it's it's um, very freeing, especially when you're working with an actor you know, that's, that's Don Cheadle because he understands, you know, he, he, he is someone who cares about the work. He cares about the process. He respects the craft. And I think that's why we all collectively love him. And so he brings that to the table um, as a director as well. You know, he know, he's sensitive to us actors and what we need and what we feel. And his process really works very well with that. You know, he's very um, just giving. He allowed me time to find it. He didn't just take me by the hand and lead me down this path, you know, and some directors can do that. And so for me, that was really a gift because you don't get that all the time, so. I mean, in first day, we, she was like thrown in the deep end. Her, the first yeah. day of shooting was when she's running out of the house uh, for her life. I hadn't met her yet. <laughs> <Like>. <laughs> Hi, I'm Yancey, I'm Don. Okay, so in this scene... Yep. <laughs> and, as uh, Miles, he's whispering in my well, ear. Well, I, I was in character, so as Miles, you know, I'm telling her, I sit your ass in this room. Yeah. <laughs> no. And when I say action, goddammit. No. So that was the first that I was, was legitimately first scared. Yeah. <laughs> it works. It works. Yeah. It's great. Good job. <laughs> um... Also, like, I know this may be weird, but can you please sign, like, my Miles Davis CDs? <laughs> like, uh, maybe afterwards. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll, All right. I'll see you afterwards. All right. Cool. Good. Hi. My question's also for Miyatsi, actually. Um, I was just curious how you felt playing Miles Davis' wife, because in, at least from the film, it seemed more like his love was kind of a twisted obsession. But, I mean, I mean, love's object, obviously. <laughs> but I was just kind of curious, how did you approach it, knowing how much he kind of dedicated his music and passion towards his wife? Mm -hmm. um, you know, their relationship, like most relationships, have their ups and have their downs, you know, but, but there is a real love that existed there at some point. There was a real, um, you know, attraction on both parts. And I think that what Miles saw, he wanted to capture. He wanted to, to keep, keep her for himself at a point. And for me, that was the interesting part about the relationship when it comes to exploring how that happens, when it comes to exploring um, how she was able to make that choice when he asks her to give up her career and she says yes. For me, that was the exciting part. That was the entry point to her, to their relationship, because there's, when we talk about love and relationships, I mean, there is a certain courage that it takes to love. And we've all have been in those relationships where we do something we would have never thought that we would have done for the sake of love. And I believe that that's what she did. Um, and, you know, people can choose how they feel about her choice, but that was a choice that she made. And I could relate to her in understanding the things that love can make you do, whatever that thing may be. Um, so for me, that's what was exciting about their relationship and, and where it could go from that, from that point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, so this is kind of for both of you. Um, I thought it was really cool, Don, when you were saying that you still play trumpet every day and that's something that's kind of changed about you and you've become a little bit more like Miles maybe. 
because of this. So I was wondering, like, in what ways, besides that, do you feel like you've become more like your characters um, after this movie, or something maybe that you've absorbed from them? Well, I, I just really tried to take away, even in the experience of making the movie, you know, I was, I was terrified every day. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, my wife was here, came and saw me halfway through the filming and said, you can't do this ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Because the stress was, you know, incredible, and you know, I lost weight, and I'm not that big to begin with, and it was just, it was really daunting. But hearing Miles' words ring through my head all the time about, you know, being on the edge of 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 your fear and stepping outside of anything that feels comfortable and or known. And, uh, you know, Tony Williams said that Miles used to throw up before every performance. You know, Tony would knock on the door and he'd go, it's time for you to throw up now, Miles. And he'd throw up and then he'd go out and play. Because you see, it was always, you know, on the edge for him. And he was always reaching for something and, and not worrying about getting there. Like I said, the, 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 the journey was the destination. And that's something that uh, you always hope to, to be able to do as an actor is to be in the moment and to put yourself in places where you're challenged all the time and not just sit back and be comfortable, you know? And not worry about if it all works or not. Uh, and take, take chances and take risks. So hopefully uh, I've absorbed some of that and will incorporate into my life going forward, my career going forward, uh, just always being a risk taker. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I would second that. That's really it. That's the exciting part of being an, an actor is putting yourself in someone else's shoes, um, whether you initially you feel like you can relate to that person or not, and then finding, oh, there is something that I can connect to, and then playing with that and seeing where that takes you. That's exciting. That's what I, my favorite part about being an actor. Thank you. That was, you were both fantastic. Thank you. Oh, thank thank you. you. Uh, Didn't you already just ask a question? Can I wait no. 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 Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. No double you can go by, Well, because we're only going to take two more questions, I think. Go ahead. Um, so first of all, I would I really love the fact that you included a little piece about dancing and about how sort of the integral nature of dancing is to music, because I think a lot of people forget about that in this day and age. Um, my particular question is about how you shot the violence and how you use the violence as sort of... Um, comic relief and um but not because it was the 70s so i was interested in um your choice um well i was interested in the choice of sort of um you know having these very violent um interactions because if you read about a lot of um, musicians from the 60s and 70s they had a lot of violent interactions um so i was interested in your choices um both um in the gun violence and in the interpersonal violence Interesting question. I never. Um, <clears throat> no, it's 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 a good question. I just have to think about it before I answer. Um, I I never know how something's gonna play. You know, I I think it is a comic beat uh, at the door when Miles tells Dave to step back a little bit so that he can get a better shot at him. I think that's. I think that's funny, and that kind of stuff was what was, was Miles. You know, Miles was quick with the fist sometimes, and uh, that was real. Um, I definitely was not playing the fight between Francis and Miles for comedy. Uh, and I, I think that with m many artists uh, and creative people, they often do live at the boundaries of their emotions. And Everything is consumed. Uh, experiences, people, everything is, is a part of their consumption. And what comes out of the other end is a painting or, or music or a dance piece. Or, and sometimes the greater the artist, the greater their volatility. Um, and many people are left in that, that wake often. Um, can you divorce the person from their behavior? Can you divorce their, the, their works from who they 
are in their lives. Some can, some can't. Uh, and without judgment, that was just the dynamic that they had, you know, and it's something that we talked to Francis about, you know, because I think you wonder, how do you, how do you go back? Why did you, you know, why did you put up with it? And uh, what were you thinking? Um, and kind of a, a victory to me in, in the movie is that she doesn't. <laughs> At the end of the day, she leaves. She's done and never to return. Uh, but interestingly, in real life, you know, they were friends after this. Uh, they were able to have some kind of a relationship uh, post all of this because there was some deeper understanding about who they both were. Because as, as Imayatse says, it, there was a contract. Um, however we want to judge it, and however we may think it is perverse or somehow insane, uh, they, there was a contract that they had between them about what that relationship was. That was ultimately broken, and uh, she left, thankfully. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't think of, of the violence, quote unquote, uh, in terms of it being either comical or dramatic. I just wanted to portray it as the uh, juice and the energy that propelled the story uh, forward, actually. Thank you. Now I gotta watch the movie again. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, first of all, you both did an incredible job. Thank uh, you. I just wanted to ask, and this is for both of you actually, um, during your research of your characters, what is the most intriguing thing you, you came across? Well, I mean, I, you listen to Miles' music, um, and you just know, for me, I just, you know, know that there's a full three-dimensional character there, a three-dimensional human being there. I know a lot of people think, oh, Miles was like, you know, just super cool and the coolest dude that ever walked the planet. Uh, and you read that he would think about, is it cooler to tap my whole foot and keep time or just tap my foot inside my shoe? Which is something you think that, <laughs> Miles gave a shit about that, you know, but <laughs> Miles thought about that. Um, and that sort of belies this idea that he's just super cool and impenetrable. You know, there's a vulnerability there. There's someone who, is, who does wonder about how people judge him and what people think about him. Uh, so all those sort of incongruent uh, elements of his life were the most interesting to me when I uh, came upon them. But really what was always the most intriguing aspect of his personality to me was his driven nature and his complete discomfort with stasis, how he could not be still. Uh, a lot of the guys that I, that I know that play with him, that I talked to, said, you know, Miles was the most restless person they'd ever met. You know, he just could not sit in it. He had to move. He was like a shark. He just, he had to keep going. So when you bump into this five-year period when he's not doing anything, you know, he was probably as close as he came to death during that time. Uh, maybe because of that, you know, maybe other people have the ability to sit still and it's all right. But for him, unless he was moving, he was going the other direction. Um, you know, for me, I really think it was, th there was this woman who had this career before Miles, you know, and, and I was really intrigued by that. You know, she was, in the original West Side Story. You know, she worked opposite Sammy Davis Jr. I mean, she had this career. She was brought up, you know, by her parents to be this prima ballerina, and she was on her way to that. Um, and I was just intrigued by the question, by her ability to be able to say yes to the question that he asked of her giving up her career. Um, that was what was most intriguing to me. Um, because for me, I think there's just a courage in there to love. It, there, there really is. She was willing to give everything up um, for this love that she felt for him. And, and I was just really intrigued by that. You know, you, you tend to ask yourself these questions of, you know, would I do that? Would I have done that? I was intrigued by her choice to do that. And and her answers about that were always very, I mean, I don't ever think I, I got the full answer. It was always the but, same. But I didn't ever want to really pry beyond mm -hmm. that. It felt mm -hmm. like a potentially, she mm -hmm. said, this is how I felt about it. I was a woman of that time. Yeah. 
And at that time, you didn't. You're, you, um, he said, a, "What woman belongs? A wife belongs with her husband." And she said, "All right." Mm -hmm. And then she said to me, which was kind of broke my heart. She's like, "Can you believe that? Can you imagine that today? Mm -hmm. if a woman yeah. saying that today?" And it was like, uh, you know. But yeah, it was. It was very complicated. It was. It, a, it, was. it was a complicated relationship. Yeah, it was, and that's what was the most intriguing part to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, this will be the last one. Go ahead. Hey, Don. Um, I have always been a film guy and not really a music guy. And I know film would be nothing without music. And I've, I'm always impressed with biopics. And now that you've accomplished this beautiful film, I feel like you should take on the life of Marvin Gaye and get that off the ground and stand behind the camera and have less stress in your life and losing weight and focus, cast somebody and direct that so people know what beautiful music he's brought to us and everything. Mm. But could you go into like why it was so stressful if it was mainly just like the working schedule or, or what was like causing your wife to say, can't there, do this again? Well, there was nothing that, I mean, I was fully exposed, you know what I mean? There was no place to hide. If it didn't work, it's because I sucked. There was no, you know, I couldn't lay it off on anyone, you know, that's my movie. I. You know, I could never say that this isn't what I intended to do. Uh, there was nobody to pass the ball to, you know, it was me. Um, and that's very uh, uh, intimidating. Um, and the things that you can't see that are going on behind the scenes, I mean, Cincinnati was great, and God bless Cincinnati, and they really, you know, big up just to let us come there and do that. But it's a kind of a new city for film, and they were not, you know, they had just, Carol had literally wrapped the week before we got there to start pre-production. We just sort of absorbed their crew and incorporated them into our crew. And they were as, as well oiled as they could have been up to that point. But not everything was 100. You know, there were days when we'd have two cameras and one cameraman. You know, I'd say, where's, where's Jim? He's like, oh, he went to shoot a commercial in Dayton. I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> or, <laughs> Or we'd have two operators and one focus puller, you know? Or uh, where, was that, where was that woman that was in that scene yesterday? Oh, she couldn't get a ride today. Wow. Fucking Uber, what are you talking about? <laughs> couldn't get a ride. <laughs> Who else can fit a seven? Who else is a seven that can fit in this dress? So every day there would be things like that that happen. The scene where I'm playing to Francis in, the, in the, the club and I'm playing blue and green, I mean, arguably one of the most beautiful ballads that anyone has ever played. Um, we're playing, I'm playing the playback, so we're, not, we're using the actual song. And because our <laughs> special effects guy, who was just kind of the guy who was like, I can do it, um, <laughs> had used so much atmosphere, it was so smoky in the room that the fire alarm was going off. <laughs> The smoke alarm was going off, and the fire department was coming. So, <laughs> in that very serene, scene. it was a beautiful scene, peaceful, beautiful <laughs> moment. It's <laughs> that's actually happening behind when I'm playing the trumpet. So, I acted my ass off that day. Emiati acted her ass off that day. I mean, and there were, and that's just three stories. Every day there was something like that that happened on the set. The lamp when I, you know, when Miles shoots the lamp in the the the, the office in George Butler's office, the uh, same special effects guy. God bless him. Thank you. Um, <laughs> built this lamp, and being an actor who's been in scenes with special effects before and pyrotechnics, you know, I know that it doesn't always go like you think it's going to go. So I said, well, before we set this actor in front of this lamp three feet away, let's do a test and just see how the lamp is going to you know, react to this squib that you put in it. So we all go to the other side of the room and, OK, ready? Uh, three, two, one. This thing explodes like <laughs> Vesuvius. I mean, oh, I was 20 yards across it. A piece of it hit me in the eye. I was like, what the fuck? He's like, oh, 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 sorry. I was like, yeah, you can't do it that big. He's like, OK, well, let's do it again. So we did it again, three, two, one, putt, nothing. <laughs> this went on for two hours. Oh boy. Literally, there were seven lamps that he rigged. <laughs> and, and 
you're sweating bullets. I mean, all you can do every and every minute on a movie is an hour. And if yeah. you're not going, you're just eating money and time. And it, it, yeah, it was, oh, we were praying, we were praying. The last one is the take that we used. And I was like, I'm sorry, my dude, if you get blinded on this one, you're just gonna be, you're going to be blinded because we're going to get this take. <laughs> So that, it was a circus. Every day it was crazy. The Jags, the, you know, we had two Jags to use for picture. One we would rig and use the other one and swap the rigs to use one for camera and use one. So when I said, hey, where's the, the second car, the picture car? They're like, oh, it's coming right now. And it pulls around the corner and it's like, <laughs> Like, you know, we're using sound. This is, we use, we record sound in a movie. We can't use that car. So it was, Every day. Every day. <laughs> hey, you're not alone. Robert Rodriguez, when he was filming Machete, there was gunshots, and uh, they called the cops on the vodka. We had that, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're going to be speaking tomorrow at the music conference. Right? Yes, yeah. there is a music conference tomorrow. Uh, do you know when and where? Uh, you know, I, I don't. and I don't want to pull out my phone and check the app on, on stage, but you should all have the South by Southwest Go app. Anyway. What time? 12.30. 12 12 tomorrow in the convention center. Robert for Glasper, Skip Leaf say is going to be there. Uh, Keon Harold, uh, myself. Who else? It came from music, so I don't know. And I, I, don't know. And I, and I think it's going to be dope, though. It's, probably, it's definitely open to music badges and check film. If there's a blue dot, it means you can go as well. If film, is, film can go too, so film and music badges, you should totally turn out for like lots more great stories. This was such a thrill for us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank so you guys much. so much. much. You guys are great. Thank you. You guys are great. <laughs> Good night.